Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the second half of Oceanography 2001. I'm hoping that you enjoyed the first half. I'm hoping you found success on the midterm or well this evening. Remember, it closes tonight at 1130, so make sure that you get it complete. Tomorrow, I will post the grades uh, after I go through all the scores and uh, make sure everything's good. So uh, what I'm sorry, what conflict through the tomorrow? I, I don't know what you're talking about. You just tell something conflict until tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to post the grades to the midterm tomorrow. Yeah, what is site means it have to be conflict? The midterm exam. Oh, okay. Yes, we did. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I will be uh, posting those grades tomorrow uh, upon uh, going through them, looking at essays, or uh, making sure all the, the multiple choice uh, were scored correctly. So they should be up tomorrow. The second half of the class is run exactly like the uh, first half. We'll be having our lecture and the assignments that accompany the lectures. Uh, the work will be due on Wednesdays. Uh, that gives us uh, time to work on them on the weekends, but they're not due on a Sunday night when I'm sleeping, so I can help you on the day that they're due. And uh, hopefully you find the system uh, working for you. Today's lesson Uh, we are looking at ocean currents. We wrapped up, you know, it's, there's no cut and dry middle of the class. It's just the middle of the semester, basically by weeks. Uh, so this just goes along with what we were uh, discussing uh, when we took the midterm break. Uh, we were looking at deep ocean currents, density differences, global winds, the interaction with the atmosphere. So this is right along those lines, the surface currents, uh, ocean, the whole dynamic or changing ocean. Uh, this image here was taken, uh, it's thermal, thermal readings from satellites. And uh, when you have a look at it here, you can see this powerful current, this red powerful current coming up and moving out is the Gulf Stream. So it moves up the coast of Florida and then follows, this is continental shelf. Continental shelf extends a little bit out. There's a little uh, area carved here. And then at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, it continues out. So the Gulf Stream is moving in this direction. It's a plume of warm water, goes across the ocean, North Atlantic current, returns in the Canary Current. Then you have the Equatorial Current Gulf Stream. So you get this big circular, it's called a gyra, G-Y-R-E, a circular gyra in each ocean, basically each ocean basin has its gyras. Uh, not pictured, but you can see a little bit of it. We have a, the equatorial current that comes either moves up into the Gulf Stream or enters the Gulf through the Straits of Florida around and out. So, much like hurricanes, which follow a similar path along the, the global winds, which follow a similar path, uh, we're being pushed by the trade winds. We're moving up and then being pushed by the westerlies. Here, these little areas, these little green blobs, those are cold core rings. As this warm water gets pushed out, the cooler water here especially in the um, spring when snow and ice melts and you get the runoff, this cold water pushes down. It's called the Labrador current, by the way. And cold water and warm water doesn't mix well, so you get these cold core rings, uh, eddies, uh, little whirlpools here in this area. 
So uh, a nor'easter is a storm that follows this Labrador current down. You've heard of nor'easters. They, they're especially uh, common in the winter uh, when the Labrador current's strong and the Gulf Stream's not quite as strong because the temperatures are cool. So uh, when you look at the, the planet here, the two major global wind belts that move surface currents are the trade winds, which blow the equatorial currents, and the westerlies. So you're having water flowing along the equator, warm water, moves up, flows along, not really the poles, but up higher, maybe 60 degrees latitude or so. So you get these huge gyras of ocean circulation in our, our, our ocean basins. Gyra here, gyra here, one here, one here, and one in the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean, a smaller scale level here where you have that warm water enter, loop around, and then return. Notice I'm drawing a circular gyra. These are regions of high pressure. So they're a clockwise turn. They turn because of Coriolis effect. They move because of global winds, the trade winds and westerlies. So these are surface currents. They're driven by winds. About 10% of the ocean is surface current. That doesn't mean, now that's with depth. That's with depth. So 90% uh, of the ocean is exposed to those deep water thermal haline currents that, that we spoke of before the midterm. And the upper portion, 10% of the ocean water is moved by surface currents. Surface currents are moved by the trade winds and they travel in circular paths like all fluids do due to Earth's rotation. Uh, the effects of the ocean, the heat transfer from tropical regions to the poles keeping the ocean's climate moderate is probably the most important aspect of currents. When you're talking uh, weather and climate, uh, think of San Francisco. San Francisco, Mark Twain once wrote the coldest uh, summer I ever spent was in San Francisco. And uh, that's because they have a cold current called the California current. So the weather is influenced by the currents. Uh, Cape Hatteras is known for rough seas, a lot of storms, influenced by that Gulf Stream turnout. Great Britain, Great Britain's very foggy. They even have London fog jackets. Uh, not snow, though, even though it's... Um, Rather high in the, the latitudes, it's very foggy, uh, a lot of cloud cover, and that's because of that warm water from the North Atlantic current that's being fed by the Gulf Stream. Uh, so weather and climate influenced by currents. Uh, the distribution of nutrients, especially in the middle of these gyrus, there's no or very little nutrients, very little life in these uh, gyrus. But along the currents, plankton, animal migration, and uh, nutrients are distributed. So uh, they do affect marine biology in that way as well. I mentioned the term gyra. You can see each ocean, each ocean has gyras. They spin in the northern hemisphere clockwise due to Coriolis effect around high pressure. In the southern hemisphere, counterclockwise due to Coriolis effect around high pressure. Notice east coast, east coast gets warm current because it's coming from the equator. That's a warm current. West coasts get cold current, cold current. That's coming more from the polar regions. The same is in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the west coast of the United States gets a cold current. The California current's cold. 
California is famous for kelp forests. That's cold water. So the marine biology of east coasts are different from west coasts because of the currents. So you don't really get coral reefs on the west coast of the United States. You get kelp forests because that water's cold. You get a lot of seals, sea lions, white sharks. On the east coast of the United States, you have a lot less of that seal, sea lion, no seals and sea lions, nope. Up north, up here in the Labrador region, you get some. We even have seals as far as um, the Gulf of Maine, but you're not getting the warm blast there because it's, it's uh, you're getting that cold Labrador push. Uh, you get a little kelp in the Gulf of Maine and New England as well, that cold water algae that only grows in cold water. You don't get coral reefs, reef building coral, unless you have the warm water. So we have the, the Caribbean reef track and the east coast of Australia has the Great Barrier Reef, but the west coast of countries in Australia don't get the coral reefs. They get the cold water species. So for the surface winds, remember the trade winds that blow along the equator move the equatorial currents and the westerlies blow uh, those northern boundary currents and southern boundary currents. The sun's heat, the uneven heating of the earth is what powers those winds. The Coriolis effect makes them turn around that high pressure system, clockwise in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere, and gravity eventually slows them down, but uh, and, and friction, but 90% of that ocean uh, is unaffected by surface currents. Only the top 10% gets affected by it. The North Atlantic gyra, which we pay the most attention to, we call that the Sargasso Sea. Remember, gyras are nutrient poor, low productivity. The Sargasso Sea was named after a brown algae that is called Sargassum. That's the genus name. Sargassum. And gulfweed is its common name. Uh, it is a brown algae and it has little floaters. So when it gets ripped up in storms and stuff, it forms a huge weed line, big sargassum mats. So we have floating sargassum, older uh, wind powered ships uh, that the explorers and the um, imperialism that that age would get uh, tangled up in these masses. Uh, so it was called the Sargasso Sea after the Sargassum. So this is our North Atlantic gyra, the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Current, the Canary Current. Notice the Canary Current's coming from more polar water, so it's a cold current. The Gulf Stream is coming from more equatorial waters, so it's a warm current. So you have warm current, cold current, warm current, and this is distributing the Earth's heat around the planet. Also, uh, here's a perfect example of marine biology, uh, sea turtles. The sea turtles hatch on our beaches all around Florida, all the way up part of the East Coast in the Gulf. And the babies, the hatchlings, swim uh, to the weed line, the sargassum and the other flotsam that's uh, out, out to soar. Sometimes it's 100 miles out, sometimes 50 miles out. It just depends on the weather and the seasons and, and storms coming on. But those uh, hatchlings have to get to the weed line to survive. If they don't make it, they don't live. So maybe one in 500 to one in 1,000 uh, make it to the weed line safely and make it through their first couple of years of life. They ride those mats of sargassum and other flotsam. If it's in the Gulf, loop current out and then into the Gulf Stream. If you're on the East Coast or in Mexico, right on the Gulf Stream, and they ride it around the Sargasso Sea. This takes seven, 10, 12 years, just depending on which part they catch it on. And 
when they return to their natal, where they hatch, their natal beaches, uh, they are not quite sexually mature, but they're 10, 12 years old. So the lost years of the sea turtle, scientists didn't know where they went from hatchling until they were older because they were living out in these gyras. So uh, the entire species, uh, all the different species of sea turtles that uh, nest in our waters and up and down the Atlantic in, in the Northern hemisphere, uh, live their lives around these ocean currents. So that's how important they are to the biology of ocean life. This image, these are the currents, major geostrophic, geostrophic, geo means uh, earth. Here's our major currents. Let's take a look at them. Notice you have gyra here. Here's your North Atlantic gyra. We talked about it. Cold water coming from the north, warm water pushing up. Here's our Labrador current. Now this, this picture is summertime. Labrador current's up high. In the winter, this Labrador current comes down. Uh, it's colder. So this is seasonal. It wobbles up and down this Labrador current, causes those cold core eddies, brings nor'easter storms down the east coast where it snows like the Dickens all the way to Washington, D.C., uh, but you never really that it's not strong enough to get past Cape Hatteras and, and the um, uh, the Gulf Stream there. But this wobbles up and down this cold water current. Here you got a lot of kelp. Notice here you got a cold current. Your warm current coming here. There's our loop current in the Gulf. It cuts through in loops and rejoins, so the water gets separated here and then rejoins up. Uh, that's what our sea turtles do is they ride these currents around. And when they make it back 10, 12 years later, now they find their feeding grounds and they're not quite sexually mature, but eventually they will. And th that's where they do the reproduction. Up, up here, up here, California current. That's why we have the great kelp forests. Uh, the cold water up here, cold water, Bering Straits, very nutrient rich. The California gray whales live up here. And when it's time for the pregnant females to uh, give birth to calf, they ride this current down and calf right here, right here in the Baja area, right at the convergence of these two currents. And they do that because there's a lot less predators and a lot calmer seas in this area. Food is not really abundant here because uh, food's more abundant in the cold water, but it's a lot safer. So their migration carries them down to give birth. They nurse their calves and then they swim back up and live up here until the cycle repeats. So they use this current and the nutrients uh, in it to uh, tailor their reproductive cycle. Here, you can see this Peru current blows out. Uh, this area here, because the trade winds are coming off and this water's moving out, is an area of upwelling. It's pulling water from the deep up. That is, this area right here is biologically the best fishing grounds in the world because of that upwelling and that nutrient rich cold water getting hit with warm water. So you got this diversity. That's where the Galapagos are those famous uh, islands that have, they have everything from penguins to tropical life as well, because you're getting the warm current and the cold current. El Nino is the phenomenon. If you take a look at this, this is our normal ocean circulation. But here, as the warm water builds up, this current can stall. It stalls periodically, every seven to 10 years. When the current stalls, the warm water sloshes back a bit and this Peru current no longer has upwelling. It's warm now, so the fishing industry suffers and there's a lot of uh, starvation in this area. All this warm water that makes it here for rain doesn't quite make it that far because it stalls, so it rains out in the ocean where you don't really need it. 
and there's droughts, drought around here. So during El Nino years, you have bad fishing, areas of drought, and uh, it does return to normal because, you know, eventually that water sloshes back a little bit and uh, the current resumes. So the El Nino cycle or the Southern Oscillation is that period where the ocean circulation pauses in uh, the Pacific Ocean. And this causes uh, areas of drought and areas of famine. So that's, that's El Nino, that little slosh back of water. The trade winds slacken a little bit because of that water pushing back on it. So it really affects the climate. Uh, oh yes, here, around the, here, this current, this west wind drift or Antarctic circumpolar current, this cold current, is the only current that circumnavigates the globe, both around the entire earth. So it's very strong and it, it has a lot of wind. So areas like around here, and here, they are very rough seas, very difficult to navigate. Cape Horn, the Cape of Good Hope are two of the uh, roughest navigation areas there are. So uh, it also stabilizes the glaciers in Antarctica because you can't get that warm water hitting them. So the glaciers in Antarctica are more stable than the Northern ice cap because you can see the warmer currents can reach it up to the northern ice cap. That doesn't mean we're not losing glaciers in Antarctica, but it does mean we're losing the glaciers at a much slower rate in the southern hemisphere. So these are our ocean currents, geostrophic ocean currents. Oh, just one last thing. Let's enlarge it one more time. Notice. West coast, cold, west coast, cold, west coast, cold, west coast, cold, east coast, warm, east coast, warm, east. So east coasts of all the continents have warmer climate, different marine biology than the west coasts of other, uh, of all the, all the continents. So the strongest of all the warm currents is the Gulf Stream. You can see it gets steered out by Cape Hatteras. It forms the western, it's on the east coast of the continent, but it's, if you go to the center of the ocean, it's called a western boundary current because it's on the west side of the Atlantic Ocean. The east and west can get confusing. The east coast of countries get western boundary currents because you're naming the current after the center of the ocean. And that's on the west part of the Atlantic. But it's on the eastern coast of the United States. So the Gulf Stream is the strongest of the currents. It's constantly doing battle with the Labrador current. There's the Gulf Stream cutting across. There's a Labrador current pushing down, icebergs flowing in the Labrador current and getting turned around when it encounters the warm water. You get these cold core eddies that spin off, cold core eddies that spin off. Uh, you know, organisms get trapped in those cold core eddies and then they would die eventually because the, the they're not stable. They don't last that long. Uh, so the uh, Labrador current is pushing down, especially during periods of melt. The current that circumnavigates the entire globe is called the west wind drift or the Antarctic circumpolar current. So we're not gonna cover every single current in depth, but the major ones we'll, we'll um, give a slide to and talk a little bit about. Uh, the canary current is the cold current that closes the loop on the North Atlantic gyra or Sargasso Sea. The California current is the cold current that pushes down the coast of California, our West Coast. Uh, nutrient rich, 
good fishing. The habitat is the kelp. Kelp forests are, uh, kelp is a cold water species. You won't find the kelp forests on the East Coast below Long Island. Above Long Island in the Connecticut Sound and a little further up, the water is sufficiently cool because of the Labrador current to support kelp. Uh, once you get past that area, it's not cold enough for kelp. So kelp, kelp's a thriving industry. It's harvested for food and for uh, gels, agar, A-G-A-R, agars or augers and gels uh, like carrageen and other gels are uh, taken from this algae and used commercially. So uh, it is a thriving industry, the uh, harvesting of kelp. They're also the base of the food chain and uh, the species, the linchpin species of kelp forests, which is a, a big ecosystem, uh, thriving ecosystem on the west coast of countries. The North Equatorial and South Equatorial Current uh, go right along the equators. They uh, are separated by that ITCZ or the doldrum uh, zone that we spoke of last class when we looked at the global winds. Now I mentioned each part of the gyra is called a boundary current. The Western boundary currents are on the East Coast of countries. The Eastern boundary currents are on the West Coast of countries. So Western boundary currents, Gulf Stream is the one that we're most interested in, the Gulf Stream. Uh, if you're a fan of Finding Nemo, the EAC, the Eastern boundary current is the one that flows in uh, the Australian region. So they flow on the east coast of countries, but they're on the west part of the gyra. They are fast, deep, and warm water. Eastern boundary current. Uh, the cold water has a little less energy, so they're not quite as um, fast flowing. They're a little more shallow, not as much energy, uh, but they do... Uh, flow on the west coast of countries. The two most important ones to us are the California current and the Peru current. The Peru current is what we talked about with that thriving industry and slackening with El Nino. And the California current is basically uh, what the original, original uh, Americans followed as they entered from Asia. They moved down the west coast on this California current because cold currents are nutrient rich. The uh, algae, kelp, uh, forms a thriving forest, kelp forests that are full of seals and sea lions, white sharks, a lot of fish. Uh, so there is a thriving uh, food source along these kelp forests. So you can see here, here's your gyras, your Western boundary currents, Eastern boundary currents, Western boundary currents, Eastern boundary currents. We're distributing heat around the globe in this manner. Uh, notice now you're gonna have warm, warm weather here. It's gonna be cooler on the West Coast. Uh, you're gonna have kelps on the West Coast, coral reefs and mangroves on the East Coast, salt marshes on the East Coast. Uh, you remember the global winds along the equator, it's low pressure. These are centered along those high pressure belts. That's why you're going in the clockwise manner in the Northern hemisphere, because it's around high pressure. So you're around high pressure belts because they're along that uh, axis of 30 degrees, which was that high pressure belt with the global winds. So, uh, that is how geostrophic currents flow, their ecological importance, their climatological importance. Uh, that's our surface currents. 
Now, smaller scale currents, Ekman spiraling or whirlpools are a smaller scale current. As wind blows and that water rushes, Ekman spirals are little whirlpools that spiral off that wind. You can kind of mimic this if you fill up a tub and run your hand really fast, you'll have swirls coming off of your hand. Those are Ekman spirals. So they, and they do spin with Coriolis effect. So they are clockwise in the Northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, sudden rushes of water, uh, input from rivers can have that water spiral off. Uh, and those are called Ekman spirals. Longshore current is a very important current. Longshore drift is the erosion of beaches because of longshore current. If you swim out and swim back, the current's going to push you in a particular direction. And it's in the direction of the prevailing winds because the waves come in on these prevailing winds at whatever angle it is. Now, the longshore current can be very weak on a gentle day, can be very strong on a windy day. It can even be in a different direction, but generally speaking, the prevailing winds cause a prevailing longshore current, which erodes our beaches. So the longshore current is parallel to the beach. It erodes the beach and it's in the direction of the prevailing winds. The rip currents are return flow as your waves come in, that water would pile up on the beach area and then they have to flow back out. And that return flow is rip currents. Now, when there's a storm out here, you're gonna get more waves and then you're gonna have stronger rips. Even if the storm is far offshore, it's still gonna churn that water up and push waves in. So the stronger the current coming in is, the stronger the rip is going out. These are dangerous and many people drown in rip currents each year. Also, it erodes beaches a great deal. So beach nourishment is when uh, we pump sand that has been lost to rip currents back onto the beach. The sand is scraped up and pumped back onto the beach at great expense to coastal towns. So we do have a hill of water. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the hill of water is uh, here. Uh, when you look at the gyra around it, uh, the hill of water in the Southern Hemisphere, in the uh, Pacific Ocean's off uh, centered, and that's why you get the El Nino. Uh, little hills of water locally build up uh, on the coast as that current gets pushed in and it returns to the rip. So sea level is not straight across, but uh, there are little hills due to geostrophic winds. Eddies, and we talked about these cold core rings or whirlpools, are when two different currents run into each other and being they're unstable, they spin off in Ekman spirals. Upwelling areas are as trade winds blow over land. So now we're looking at upwelling near the equator on the west coast or westerlies blow in the other direction over the east coast up in that uh, 60 degree range. You get deep nutrient rich water pulled up and then out away from shore. And these tend to be the nutrient rich, fabulous fishing grounds like the Bering Straits from the westerlies and Wicked Tuna are near uh, um, the Gulf of Maine. And then here, this is the most famous one uh, here in the Peru area, the Peruvian anchovy industry. So upwellings are local currents generally caused by wind. And they are when nutrient rich water is pushed to the surface. Another example of upwelling is the Alamorada humps. Uh, what happens is underwater, you have humps down in the keys uh, near Alamorada. And as the loop current flows over them, it's got to go up and over those humps. 
and it's bringing nutrient rich water up. And that's why Isla Mirada is called the fishing capital of the world because you get that loop current with upwelling and it's thriving for mahi and tuna and oh goodness, wahoo, wahoo, wahoo fish. Uh, so there's great fishing in those areas of the humps because of upwelling. Uh, so upwelling brings nutrient, nutrient rich uh, water, which is slightly cooler to the surface. Downwelling, which is the exact opposite, downwelling causes, um, downwelling causes nutrient rich water to go deep and there are areas that are very unproductive. So coastal upwelling brings nutrient rich to, uh, areas to the surface, increasing the ecology. Coastal downwelling pumps nutrient rich water too deep and hurts the ecology. Something that I see fairly often on a windy day is slicks or stripes. You get a buildup of uh, seagrass that's been pulled up or flotsam because the wind blows and you actually get little convergent cells in there as the wind blows by, causing stripes of flotsam to build up on the surface. So you'll get little weed lines on a windy day because of this striping effect. Now we did mention non-El Nino, La Nina, normal conditions, we'll start with that. Here's your trade winds and your equatorial current. There's your upwelling, bringing nutrient rich water to the surface. There's your rainfall in Asia, providing the rice and the crops, great fishing, great crops, normal conditions. But the water builds up a little hill here, like we mentioned that hill of water, because it's always flowing there. So the water has to return every now and again. And that return flow stalls the current, stalls the trade winds, stalls this upwelling, and actually that slosh back causes a little downwelling. So the economic impact of fishing here because all these little fishing villages are not getting anything. It's terrible. You have drought along this Indonesia and uh, Pacific Rim. So the rice, which is uh, needs a lot of water and many of the crops fail. So you get a lot of drought, really a lot of famine and bad fishing, and then rain in the middle of the ocean. So El Nino affects world climate in that way. So thermal haline circulation, which we <clears throat> looked at last time, a quick review being we're doing the circulation of water, <clears throat> is caused by density differences. These de density differences are uh, temperature, salinity. Remember your surface water, then you have your intermediate, and then your deep, and your your deep water is North Atlantic deep water and Antarctic bottom water. Your intermediate and then your surface. There is this little blip in the Atlantic Ocean is caused by the Mediterranean Sea. So there is, in, in, in this area, there is a little bit of a uh, input from the Mediterranean Sea, but there's your intermediate water, there's your deep water, there's your surface. In the Pacific Ocean, surface, intermediate, deep. Indian Ocean, little blip from the Red Sea, surface, intermediate, deep. So all of the oceans are stratified by density. They flow very slowly, and the flow is like this. Your Antarctic bottom water flows along the bottom. It leaves those ripples. That North Atlantic deep water 
very little mixing in the intermediate, little Mediterranean influence, and then the surface. We call all that flow worldwide the ocean conveyor belt. So our general circulation, we have surface currents. We have our downwelling near polar regions. Spreads along the deep. Has a hard time crossing this thermal climb, but eventually returns to the surface. Lastly, our local currents, the Gulf, we get input from equatorial, notice it splits and some of it goes up, the Gulf Stream goes up. It enters the Gulf, it's called the loop current, loop current, and then re-enters the Gulf Stream through what we call this little channel, the Straits of Florida, and that's called the Florida Current. So the Yucatan Current enters the Loop Current, Florida Current, back to the Gulf Stream. So that's our little local current that affects us. I remember that oil spill, your oil spill, and the oil got caught in the loop current. Fortunately, the storms weren't pushing it to the coast and it sank. They were worried about it making it all the way to the Keys, because notice the Florida current goes right by the Keys, the humps of Isla Mirada get that upwelling. But this is our water flow in the Gulf. So this week's lesson was on surface currents. Now the work that is due next Wednesday, let's have a look. The discussion forum for next Wednesday, if I can open it and make it bigger for me. How do ocean currents work? We do have a video presentation on ocean currents. One of the most interesting uh, things that happened was uh, in 1992, a ship uh, ran into a storm and lost a lot of its cargo. And these cargos were rubber duckies. Believe it, rubber duckies. And these rubber duckies floated on the ocean and were tracked. And that's how we got a lot of our uh, ocean data from a accident of a cargo ship spilling rubber duckies into the ocean. It's kind of funny, but it's what happened. And uh, so we'll be looking at uh, that event and having a discussion forum on that. And that will be due next Wednesday, next Wednesday. The uh, Another thing that we'll be doing next Wednesday is Designing a PowerPoint. Let's see if I can. Designing a PowerPoint, this should be it. No, nope. that's how ocean currents, we just saw that. Uh, designing a PowerPoint, let's see if I can find that. Let me just close up this, uh, how do ocean currents work? Don't save. See if I can find designing a PowerPoint. Yep, gotcha. All right, designing a PowerPoint. So we learned about ocean circulation. We learned about the stratification of the ocean with the Antarctic bottom water, North Atlantic deep water, intermediate water containing the pycnocline, thermocline, and haleocline and the surface water. Your job is to make a PowerPoint presentation talking about the layers of the ocean as if you were giving a lecture on it. Submit a 10 to 15 slide presentation on the layered ocean. Submit a separate reference page, separate reference page. So you're gonna submit two files into the Dropbox. One will be a PowerPoint, 10 to 15 slides. One will be 
a reference page. I've provided this URL, and I'll run to that URL, to uh, help you in designing a proper PowerPoint. Why do we do this? Uh, my goodness, I know a lot of people have had to give presentations in their life, not just teachers. Uh, my wife is in HR and she makes annual presentations. Uh, I know people who've had to do presentations for interviews. And part of your presentation is designing a high quality visual aid, the most common PowerPoint. So this is also, hey, I mean, I want you to, to learn and, and show me you've learned about the layered ocean. Okay, I want to see the terms like thermal client, halo client, pycnocline. I want you to talk about the uh, thermal haline circulation and uh, along those lines. So I do want to see that oceanography, but I also want you to get practice in making an efficient and nice slideshow in case you need it later in life. Because most of you are not going to be thinking pycnocline when you're 25, 30, or 40, or whatever you're going to be. Uh, but most of you will have to communicate effectively in your line of work. So this kind of is to help you become more efficient at, at that aspect. So look through the tips for making effective PowerPoint, like limiting your punctuation, don't put words in all caps, uh, Leave a little empty space between uh, things. You know, don't write a whole paragraph. Uh, you know, use keywords and bullets tend to tend to do that. Read through this and use this. We're not going to have to have a plan B for technical difficulties because you're not going to be making the presentation. Uh, you're not going to have to learn to speak to your slides, although this is all very good information. Use contrasting colors for text and background. All this stuff is going to help you make a higher quality presentation. So use this to kind of help you make the best presentation you can make. Give a separate reference page. Don't put it on a slide because nobody wants to look and read references during a presentation. That's always provided as a supplement in, uh, in a presentation. So uh, pretend you're making a presentation, submit what you'll be using and your supplemental suggested reading that you use to put the project together. Those two assignments are due next Wednesday. Many of you have taken the midterm, few of you have put it off to the last minute. If you put it off to the last minute, good luck. If you've taken it already, breathe a nice sigh of relief. We do have those two assignments due next Wednesday. I will be posting the grades for the midterm tomorrow. And Monday, we will continue with Ocean Dynamics. Until then, have a great day. I'll hang around as you log off for any questions that may pop up. But uh, have a great day, and I will see you all Monday. Hey, Professor, I had, I had a quick question. This is Artesia. So I noticed when you were talking about the cool West Coast and warm East Coast that it seemed to maybe correlate with um, how the Western part of the United States is more dry and the Eastern part is more lush. Do you know if that is what affects that or if that's just a coincidence? That is 100% part of it because warm water uh, evaporates easier than cold water. So oh, right. that is definitely plays a role. But remember, the Pacific Northwest is very, very wet. So, and that's because of the mountain effect. So mm -hmm. it's not the only reason why, but that does play a large role in it. All right. Um, do you know if there are any other, um, because I found this course to be like extremely interesting, even though we're only halfway through. Do you know if there are any other classes um, at SPC that you would recommend taking after this one? Well, I am teaching the marine biology course next semester Ooh. Uh, on field trips. We meet on Monday mornings for field work. Uh, there'll be virtual trips 
there'll be uh, guided tours and there'll be self trips and then the lectures are all recorded. So it's a once a week meeting for trips or doing a project and then the, the, um, the lectures are all on a uh, recorded video. So there's that. And then the earth science course uh, has a smidge of oceanography but it covers geology and it's very similar to this class only it's about land. Oh, very cool. And is the marine biology, is that considered to be a blended class? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm teaching it. Uh, we meet once a week, uh, but it'll be uh, field trips. And we, you know, I'll, I'll, I break it up into different groups. Group mm -hmm. will be working on a uh, project. Group B will meet me at Honeymoon Island. And Group C will be going to Whedon Island and doing a, a self-guided tour. And then next week I take group B to Honeymoon Island and they just rotate through. Oh, so it's not like on one of the campuses? Uh, it's, we meet at Honeymoon Island in Fort DeSoto. It's a meeting out in the field. Oh, okay. Very cool. So it's kind of like online and then with live field meetings. All right. All right, cool. Thank you. No that was problem. It. Have a good one. You too. Thanks. Yep, yeah, bye.